Hello and welcome. I'm Rainey Christie, Regional Head of Distribution for Allianz Global Corporate and Specialty. Thank you for joining us for this exclusive webinar today where we're going to provide some insight on the 12th annual Allianz Risk Barometer Report, which identifies the top corporate risk for the next 12 months and beyond. We're going to find out what's at the very top of mind of our risk management professionals. I'll be your moderator and I'm looking forward to today's program. We've got a great lineup. I'll give you a brief overview of this meeting before we pass it off to our subject matter experts. Today's agenda will include a high level overview of our methodology for developing the report, followed by a list of the top risk. Next, we'll dive into the, our, with our subject matter experts and overviews of cyber, business interruption, shortage of skilled workforce, and finally, we'll conclude with a detailed presentation on the topic of macroeconomic developments. Our speakers today will be Teresa Stevens, Regional Head of Cyber, Brenda Ledley, Regional Head of Human Resources, Thomas Varney, Regional Manager of Allianz Risk Consulting, and our special guest speaker, a good colleague of mine, Dan North, Senior Economist from Allianz Trade. Let me welcome all of our guest speakers to the show. The 12th annual Allianz Risk Barometer incorporates the views of over 12, uh, 2,700 respondents from 94 countries and that across 23 industry sectors. The survey was conducted amongst Allianz clients from around the world, broker partners, industry trade organizations, as well as risk consultants, underwriters, senior managers, and claims experts in the corporate insurance segment of both Allianz global corporate and specialty, and other Allianz entities. The report goes into detail about these top risks globally, by country, and by sector. Most answers were from large companies, greater than half a billion in annual sales. That was about 47% of the respondents. Mid-sized companies comprised of about 20% of the respondents, and that was companies between the 250 million revenue to 500 million in revenue. And small size enterprises, less than 250 million in revenue, produced about 34% of our overall respondents. And again, risk experts crossed 23 different industry sectors uh, in this report. Two, three, one. This is a high level overview of the top 10 risk. All respondents could select up to three risks per industry which is why the figures do not add up to 100%. Cyber, business interruption, and macroeconomics are the top three. But interesting enough, a fourth important risk has prevailed, shortage of skilled workforce. This creeped into the top 10 in 2021, made it to the top five in 2022, and has gotten to place four in this year's Allianz Risk Barometer Report. Okay, now th this tees up our subject matter experts quite nicely. We're gonna hear first from Teresa Stevens on cyber. Teresa, over to you. Thanks, Rainy. So it's perhaps somewhat unsurprising that cyber incidents have topped the list again this year, given the sheer potential impact of a cyber event and the prevalence and frequency of high profile stories in the media. Um, there have been widely publicized attacks across all industries impacting large tech companies, healthcare entities, educational institutions, and even recently a national government. Uh, cyber attacks are still industry agnostic and almost all modern businesses, regardless of scale or specialization, increasingly rely on a network of connected technologies to operate. And so there's this ever increasing concern as we embed our lives and businesses further in tech that an attack that takes down your network could cause a major detrimental impact to your business. And depending on the margins in which you operate and the duration of that outage, it could even pose an existential threat to your business. Um, and while I'm pleased to report that cybersecurity awareness has increased and we're seeing more focus and investment being made in the space by organizations to properly mitigate that exposure, it's, it's just really difficult to contain the threat. I mean, we're talking about a threat landscape cultivated by sometimes very sophisticated criminals motivated by a potentially very lucrative payday. And it's challenging for even the most cyber-focused businesses to hire the resources they want to, given the current skills shortages in cybersecurity. 
Um, companies are really struggling right now because the demand for cybersecurity professionals is skyrocketing in line with that threat, and supply just can't really keep up with demand. Uh, we're also seeing that small to mid-sized businesses often underestimate their exposure, and really they're increasingly vulnerable because they're less likely to have resources to dedicate to in-house expertise. Uh, they're often identified by those threat actors as sort of low-hanging fruit um, because there is that expectation that they won't be able to put up a fight. And small to mid-sized businesses are also particularly vulnerable to digital supply chain attacks because they're often relying on larger vendors to provide applications and services. So if they rely on a third party in order to conduct business, then that's one additional layer of exposure that they might have limited control over. The frequency of ransomware attacks remains high. And though we've been talking a bit about smaller organizations, the cost of ransomware attacks has also increased as criminals target larger organizations, supply chains, and critical infrastructure. Uh, and much like last year, double and triple extortion attacks are still increasingly common. Uh, double extortion being where sensitive data gets stolen as part of the attack and then used as leverage for your extortion demand. Um, so, you know, sort of if uh, you don't pay the ransom by a certain date, your sensitive info is maybe then published on the dark web. And triple extortion is when attackers attempt to take money from both the organization they initially targeted and then also uh, the third parties that might be impacted by leaking that data. Um, so an example would perhaps be a healthcare entity being extorted, um, but then so are all the patients whose info was stolen from that healthcare provider. Um, so data breaches and ransomware events, are, they're really two sides of the same coin. Teresa, I got to tell you, I feel like there's a lot we just don't know about cyber, and it's all very interesting. Uh, and I think that's one reason why cyber continues to rank at the top of the Allianz Risk Barometer as a key risk globally and in the U.S. Uh, given how much we hear about ransomware and the related business inter interruption cost, um, why do you think data breaches have topped ransomware in terms of cyber exposures that companies are most concerned about? It's a great question. Uh, I think the shift in focus to data breaches has really been impacted by the changing regulatory landscape. Uh, so as consumers become increasingly concerned about their privacy and the protection of their information in this ever-connected world we live in, uh, more and more geographies and U.S. states regulators are shifting from a harm-based model of privacy laws to a rights-based model. And what that really means is that it's no longer just has a company's mishandling of your information caused you some tangible financial harm, like a person using your leaked social security number to open a line of credit. Um, but it's turning into, has a company utilized your personal information without explicitly obtaining your consent? And sometimes in every single instance that they utilize it, uh, the Illinois Supreme Court just issued a ruling in one matter concerning the Biometric Information Privacy Act, or BIPA, uh, that each time an entity scans or transmits an individual's biometric data, it constitutes a separate violation and penalties accrue per violation. Uh, so the penalties can potentially add up quite quickly, say, if your business mismanages employee biometric data that's used on a regular basis, like if it's the thumbprint that you're using to clock in every day. Based on that, Teresa, I think it uh, every right for us to be concerned about those data breaches. Um, do you think as cyber criminals adopt this new AI-based tools, it will make it more challenging for organizations to protect themselves? There is a lot of focus on AI right now, and for good reason. Uh, machine learning is ushering in new challenges to the status quo just across the board. Uh, folks might be most familiar with it in more of a media content context from what's in the news lately. Uh, sort of how do we interpret fair use of intellectual property when AI tools use a data lake to create derivative works? Um, because machines are utilizing a kind of pattern recognition to generate portraits of us to post on social media or the lyrics to an unwritten Nick Cave song or an audio recording that sounds like Rihanna singing a popular Beyonce song. Um, AI in the cyber threat and cybersecurity context works exactly the same way. So cyber criminals utilize AI to automate finding weaknesses in cyber defenses or to develop phishing emails that are harder for an average person to identify as a threat. And this really puts organizations in a position where they have to fight fire with fire and also use machine learning to detect or to better detect anomalous behavior and zero day threats on their own networks. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, 
What can companies do to protect themselves, or at least the very least, move cyber down in their list of concerns? Rainy, this is going to sound like a canned response, but it's canned because it's tried and true. Organizations need to focus on good cyber hygiene, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Know your exposure, know what data assets you're handling, and the regulations applicable to those data assets and manage access restrictions appropriately. You have to pay attention to what's shifting in the world around us, advances in technology, the regulation around tech that impact other parts of our lives, also impact our businesses. Um, and you have to really look at what your vendors are doing to protect themselves and then your business by extension. Uh, but I would, I would say most importantly, prepare for the worst case scenario and focus on redundancy and resiliency within your system. Uh, given how fast threat actors evolve in cyber, a plan just isn't a good plan unless there's also a backup plan. Um, but I'm hopeful that if businesses stay on the front foot and are proactive about mitigating their exposure, that we can hopefully get cyber moved down the list next year. Solid advice. Thank you very much. And Teresa, thank you so much for your fascinating insight as it relates to cyber risk. Now we'll turn it over to Thomas Varney to discuss business interruption. Thomas, over to you. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, it's interesting that business interruption uh, was in 2023 the number two risk after cyber um, uh, risk concern. And what uh, what is interesting over time, as you look at this this as this bar, is that business interruption has been either one or two over the last six years. And ever since the risk barometer started 12 years ago, it has been a, a top uh, concern of all respondents to the risk barometer. Um, it's interesting as we look at the next slide as to what really is driving uh, the concern here is really cyber incidents, which is one, uh, natural catastrophe, fire and explosion, and supplier failure, which are all things that have been driving this concern uh, you know, previously. But the one interesting thing is that the energy crisis actually popped up to number two as the concern that is driving their business interruption thoughts. So that's interesting as you look at the history of the risk barometer, the things that drive these things of concern do change over time. And that's why it's important that businesses continue to be resilient on the exposures that they face each and every day. Tom, over the history, the risk barometer uh... Uh, business interruption and continues to be one of the top one or two concerns for clients and brokers each year. What are the main factors that drove this in 2023 and are they similar from previous years? Well, as you, as you can see from the slide there, that business interruption is interconnected uh, with many, if not all of the, uh, the risk barometer exposures that you covered, the top 10. Uh, situations like cyber, uh, the pandemic, uh, worker shortages, uh, fire and explosion, and also natural, natural catastrophes are all continue to somewhat drive this and continue to drive this as we go as we go forward. The business interruption concerns. Two things that actually came up uh, in 2022 were macroeconomics and the energy crisis, which were not top risk or top concern in previous risk barometers. So what you can see is that either each year, there seems to be one or two different things that pop up as a concern. That is why it's really important for businesses to continue to be resilient as they look at what exposures they face um, going forward. Thank you, Tom, very, very insightful. Um, one additional question, um, actually two more, excuse me. So in terms of um, de-risking and, and business resilience, it seems to be part of the vocabulary um, in terms of solutions to mitigate business interruption exposures. Uh, how can insurance carriers support clients uh, and brokers or, or regarding this matter? Thanks, Randy. Uh, each business must address their needs on an ongoing basis because there is an ever-changing exposures that businesses face. Um, with this in place, the development of transparency between clients, brokers, and carriers can actually allow the key needs of clients to be addressed. Understanding of the overall business resiliency and needs of each client 
can help with what types of coverages can be applied to the specific client needs that they have. So that's really what we're looking at is really how can we be more transparent? How can businesses and clients and brokers work better together or how can businesses, clients and carriers work better together to make sure that we're addressing what the actual exposures are? That makes complete sense, Tom. Transparency and business resiliency go hand in hand for sure. Tom, final question. Um, do you believe business interruption as it relates to clients, carriers, and brokers will continue to be a top three concern over the next five to 10 years? Yes, I do believe that business interruption will continue to be an ongoing concern as we go into the future. Uh, as noted earlier, there are an interconnectivity between many of the risks that are happening. So an exposure in one area can actually impact another area um, as you look at it. Since, like we said, uh, cyber, energy, natural catastrophe, fire and explosion, supplier failure, all are things that can, uh, can affect business interruption or the concern around business interruption. We previously had the pandemic. We continue to have a shortage of skilled workforce that is impacting us. And now here in, in 2022, we have, and 2023, we have macroeconomics and the energy crisis that is impacting or driving this business interruption concern. So what, what's going on is that what will arise? What are the ongoing things that are happening? And how can we as carriers and businesses continue to address those ever-changing concerns? Tom, thank you so much for your insight. We're now going to explore our final topic of shortage of skilled workforce with Brenda Ledley. Brenda, handing it over to you. Thanks, Rainey. So um, there is 75% of our companies that were surveyed said the difficulty of hiring employees continues. In fact, it's at a 16 year high globally. It moves up one position globally to number eight, and McKinsey reported that 40% of workers would consider leaving their jobs in the near future. Turning to the U.S. in particular, uh, last year it was reported there were almost two unfilled positions in the U.S. for every job seeker, and in the risk barometer, this risk was number four last year and the year before. So it's held steady at number four. And we have about 50 million workers who quit their job in 2022. Brenda, the shortage of skilled workforce has risen to the top four risk in USA. And so clearly this is a serious matter that's on top of many industry professionals. What does, um, what does the industry have to do to have an impact on this? Well, this is very concerning for our respondents in the aviation, aerospace, engineering, construction, and professional services sectors. And for AGCS in North America in particular, we are seeing talent shortages in all major niche underwriting roles, but especially in inland marine and builders risk construction underwriting and for other specialty underwriting roles on the West Coast, in Chicago, and in New York. Employees really want an improved work-life balance and flexibility. They're looking for increased compensation and a strong company culture. In fact, many candidates are asking for 100% full-time work from home, and they're willing to wait for the employer who will offer this. We're in a bit of a catch-22, because so many people within the industry made career moves in the last two years, they're not willing to move again. Stability is really the name of the game now, especially as the media reports on a possible recession and a softening market. As a result, an already small marketplace is even smaller. And even worse, there's unfortunately also a lack of diverse candidates to consider. Mm. It does sound like we have a challenge on our hands. Me and a few colleagues often wonder, where are all the skilled workforce going? <laughs> yes, a lot of people want to know this. The interesting thing is that hiring rates outpaced quit rates since November of 2020. 
So yes, many workers quit, but many got rehired elsewhere or retired as the higher than normal retirement rates showed. As people reevaluated their lives, some simply decided they wanted to stay at home more or they wanted to start an Etsy business or participate in the gig economy. Mainly though, the great resignation was more the great reshuffle. Mm, apparently so. Well, as an industry, what do we need to do to remain competitive for this war on talent? And what is Allianz doing specifically? So there's no doubt that COVID upended the social contract between employers and employees. Companies are now expected to more proactively address a range of issues from health and safety to well being and diversity, while also driving initiatives for societal good, like reducing environmental impact and increasing inclusive growth. Company culture becomes a real differentiator. And AGCS has spent the past few years rebuilding our culture to reflect this. For example, we identified nine core values, including trust, diversity and inclusion, and personal growth that speak to who we are as a company. And each of those values translates into behaviors, leadership commitment, and actions. For instance, in terms of personal growth, we invested heavily in learning and development, not only for leaders, but in early careers programs. An example for trust, we decided to trust our people enough to allow them to work from another country for up to 25 days per year, which is really a unique benefit in the industry. And in the DNI space, we built a solid team of leaders and volunteers to run relevant activities, publish articles, track progress, and bring in world class speakers. For us, we're able to attract candidates due to Allianz's global presence, financial st stability, and reputation. And of course, locally, we invest substantially in our benefits and, as already mentioned, our culture. Wow, that's quite a bit. Well, Brenda, thank you so much for your expertise on this subject. I know it's a very popular topic, uh, in not only in the insurance industry, but also in corporate America. And I also want to thank you, Teresa and Tom, for your insights as well on cyber and business interruption. I'd now like to turn our attention and introduce our guest speaker, Dan North, Senior Economist for Allianz Trade North America. Dan has been with Allianz Trade North America since 1996, using macroeconomic analysis to help manage Allianz's trade risk portfolio of more than 150 billion annual US trade transactions. Dan has appeared on CNBC, Fox Business News, Bloomberg Radio and Television. And he's been quoted by Business Week, Financial Times, NBC, the BBC, New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. After having predicted the 08 09 recession and its implications accurately, Dan was ranked fourth on the Bloomberg list of top 65 economic forecasters in 2010. Dan holds an MBA from Wharton Business School. And as you know, as we listed earlier, macroeconomic developments has risen to become one of the top risks for many countries, including the US. We're all curious to know the outlook on rising interest rates, inflation, and more. And here to enlighten us, Dan North, over to you. Rainey, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Okay, I am going to talk about uh, 20 minutes about the U.S. economy. Um, and I'm going to start off with the positive things, because right now there really aren't a whole lot of them. In fact, I tell a lot of audiences, I'm about to ruin your day. Let me start with the positive ones, because there are some. And one of the big positive ones is... Consumer spending. Consumers drive 70% of all economic activity. You know, people going out and buying food and clothing, gasoline, and so forth. That accounts for 70% of all economic activity. The consumers still have the willingness and ability to spend. So the chart over on the left, that's consumer confidence. 
you can see it's above average and rising. Consumers have the willingness to spend and they also have the ability to spend, which is income. That's the chart on the right, disposable income. Now, the columns are the month-to-month -month growth in income. And you can see that red column in January took a big bump up. That was because there was a 9% cost of living adjustment increase in Social Security, and there weren't as many taxes paid. So this uh, gave a pretty big bump to income. And you can see it also drove up the year-over-year -year rate, which is the line, so over 3%, and that's about average on the long term. So these are good things, willingness and ability to spend. Other good things we have in the economy is the labor market. That's the chart on the left. Now, the brown columns are the number of jobs grown or lost every month in the economy. And you can see that one there in the middle where it dips way down. That was, of course, COVID. We lost 22 million jobs. But ever since then, we've been creating jobs at the rate of about 500,000 a month compared to an earlier average of about 200,000. Now, the, uh, you know, the jobs, we say they've been created, but in actual, actuality, most of them have been recovered. What I mean is this, you know, COVID shut down, temporarily shut down a lot of businesses, so people became unemployed temporarily. Well, then maybe a month later, open back up and walk through the door. Well, that counts as job creation. It wasn't really creation, it's just business was temporarily closed. So most of those jobs you've seen, you see there, uh, all but about 10%, are job recovery. So when people tell you that the economy is doing great in terms of creating jobs, take it with a grain of salt. The other big measure is that blue line, the unemployment rate. Um, the Federal Reserve loves this. A lot of economists love this. It's down at a 50-year low. That's, that's great. It is. But you have to be aware of how that's calculated. And basically, the government calculates it as this. If you're Unemployed, you don't have a job, but you're looking for one. You're counted as unemployed. If you don't have a job, but you're not looking for a job, you're not counted as unemployed. You're counted as not participating. So the unemployment rate doesn't tell you anything about how many people are sitting, sitting at home working to know what it is. It's low, good, we'll take it. Let's you know, take it with a grain of salt. The other thing that's going for us is the chart on the right. This is this ISM. Uh, survey, it's Institute of Supply Management. It's, been a sur it's a survey that's been around for, you know, almost the end of World War II. And uh, the trick with this uh, survey is when the lines are above the level of 50, it means expansion. So this is the services sector, 80% of the economy. The total index, the overall index, that brown line at 51, well, it's above 50. That means services is still growing, but it sure is weakening. And the new orders component of this survey, well, it's 52.2, that's above 50. So it's growing. This is things that are going to contribute to work coming through the pipeline, new orders, and that's growing as well. Um, kind of not looking like it's going the right way, but still positive. So we still have this labor market, services, consumer, and so forth. But we know there are a lot of negatives in the economy. Inflation, and in particularly, the Fed's cure for inflation, how it's damaging the economy. And we'll show some examples like the housing market, manufacturing, labor market, and of course, now the banks. So how do we get this inflation? Well, I'll kind of lay it right at the feet of the Federal Reserve. That's the chart on the left. The Federal Reserve has two tools to manage the economy. First is that blue line, the Fed funds rate. Uh, you know, we, we always say, and I say it too because it's convenient that the Fed is raising rates. Well, they really only control that one rate, that overnight rate. You can see, you go back in the 80s when inflation was really high, it was above 20%. But then over the past couple of decades, it's worked down until we reached the Great Recession, the global financial crisis, and the Fed funds rate was set to zero. Never been done before. Well, those conditions, uh, you know, we got out of that crisis and we started to raise rates again, but then COVID came along and we went back to 0% rates. Okay, 
The other tool the Fed has to manage the economy is this brown area cap called the balance sheet. You just think the balance sheet is the amount of money the Fed is making available to uh, the financial uh, situation, sending credit, liquidity, all the way down to making individual loans. And you can see from the brown over on the left, it was never used as a tool before. It just naturally grew along with the size of the economy until we reached the Great Recession and the global financial crisis. And the Federal Reserve exploded the balance sheet, pumped enormous amounts of liquidity and money into the economy. That's what this is. The balance sheet expanding is basically money printing. So that accelerated during the Great Recession came back down a little bit, but then COVID hit, and the Fed expanded the balance sheet, exploded the balance sheet again. So you have an enormous amount of money and liquidity sitting in the economy at 0% interest rate. This is the classic formula for inflation. If, if you wanted to create inflation, that's what you do. You print money and set interest rates to zero. Classic formula for inflation. Now I say over here in the middle, the Fed has made its own mess, created too much easy money for too long. And here's exactly what I mean. You know, 2020, you shut down the economy in the second quarter. The third quarter comes along, tremendous growth. The economy is doing fantastic. So if you're the Federal Reserve, you might say, well, you know, let's wait one more quarter just to make sure everything's okay. So they waited one quarter, and then a second quarter, a third quarter and a fourth quarter, and arguably a year too long, they kept these emergency conditions in place, a gigantic balance sheet at 0% rates. Classic formula for inflation. Item number two in that box is then they started this, this narrative in 2021 of inflation is just transitory. So for instance, an inflation report would come out, it used to be 2%, now it's 4% this month, they say, don't worry about it, it's okay. It's just labor shortage and supply chain. It'll be all right, transitory. Next month it comes out, you know, maybe it's 6%. Don't worry about it, it's gonna go away. Said this all the way through 2021 until December of 2021 when they finally said, yeah, I guess it really wasn't transitory. Inflation is, is kind of here to stay. So item three here, they admitted inflation wasn't transitory, but then they waited four more months to do anything about it. In fact, they kept expanding the balance sheet for four more months. They waited four months to raise the Fed funds rate. To me, that was kind of incomprehensible because you know you just wrecked your car and you wait four months to call 911. It just doesn't make sense to me. So the Federal Reserve started desperately behind the curve when they started to raise rates to uh, fend off inflation. Way late, especially when you realize that it takes three to five quarters to have full effect on the economy when you change monetary policy. Finally, keep in mind, because they had to raise so rates so rapidly, this is what happens when a central bank raises rates to fend off inflation. It also is more or less deliberately slowing the economy. That's the big risk. It works every time. That's the risk. Box over on the right talks about the fiscal stimulus of $5 trillion plus, and that certainly contributes to inflationary pressures. No, no two ways about it, but I think it's the Federal Reserve making too much easy money available for too long, creating this inflation. Now, part on the left, shows consumer price index, most commonly cited uh, inflation measure. The blue line there peaked back in June at 9.1% and has now fallen pretty steeply down to 5%. In fact, in just the last month, it fell from 6 to 5%. That's, that's a pretty big decline. So it looks to me like you know CPI is pretty much peak. Now, there's another part of CPI, which is what we call a core that strips out uh, food and energy prices because they're so volatile. That's the brown line. And you can see that's been a little bit more stubborn. That's a little bit more sticky. It's going down, just not as fast as the CPI. Another measure of inflation is called the producer price index. That's in the middle chart. And it peaked last month at almost 12%. The PPI is 
a measure of uh, what producers are getting for the goods that they produce, producer side, not the consumer side. And you can see it has fallen very rapidly. It's fallen from 11.7% to 2.7%. Now, that's remember the Fed's target is 2%. Not on this measure, but you know we're getting towards uh, a, a range that's more in line. And this is particularly good because here's CPI again, the same blue line is over on the left. CPI leads the CPI. In other words, this big decline would tend to make you think we've got more declines in CPI coming. One problem we have with inflation, which is looking bright in most spots, is the chart on the right. Fed is now looking at this thing they've invented called super core inflation, which strips out housing as well as food and energy. And uh, that's actually, as you can see in the chart, has been kind of drifting. It's been kind of stubborn. I'm pretty sure it'll start cover coming down, but it's not just as compelling as the other measures. All right. So the Fed's been hiking rates, uh, raising rates. Question is, how much more are they going to do? Well, first, over on the left, you can see uh, the Fed has been, in this instance, the most aggressive in the modern era. Each one of those lines the beginning of a tightening cycle back through history. You don't have to look at all the lines. You just have to look at the red one. That's where we are now. And you can see how much more rapidly the Federal Reserve has raised rates this time than in other hiking cycles. So they're meeting again on May 3rd. Are they going to raise rates? Probably they will. But should they? I'd say no. And here's why. The economy is slowing. Personal consumption has fallen two of the past three months. Retail sales down four of the past five months. We'll see the housing market's been shattered, manufacturing's in recession, labor market's weakening, we have a banking crisis, all the leading indicators say recession, and inflation is peaked by that one measure. And, and perhaps more importantly, it takes time for interest rate hikes to affect the economy. So I have this sort of conceptual diagram on the right each one of those red arrows is an interest rate hike, the first one being back in March of 22, a year ago. So if it takes three to five quarters, well, you could say, geez, it's only now really getting all the way through to inflation. How about the one in May? Well, yeah, that's probably going uh, all the way through to inflation. June, yeah, maybe. But a lot of these arrows, this ammunition that's been shot, already inflation hasn't reached the target yet. So you see the economy weakening, and you know you've got all this ammunition flying already. Maybe you could give it a rest. Maybe you could give it a rest, but they probably won't do that. And that's a disappointment because it's so dramatically affected parts of the economy, including the housing market. Over on the left, let's take a look at this. That vertical dotted line, that's when the Fed came out and said, yeah, inflation is not transferred after all. The financial markets heard that and realized, well, they're going to start raising rates. And that's the blue line there is the 30-year mortgage. As soon as they heard that, boy, that just screamed up to 7% from 3%, doubled in the course of the year. At the same time, of course, existing home sales, the brown line fell 25%. Now, the chart in the middle is starts and permits. A housing start is when guys are actually starting to break ground. And again, the vertical line is when the Fed it's not said it's not transitory. Well, starts and permits have been down pretty dramatically. Yeah, you can see they're curving back up, but they're very volatile. But the point is that once the Fed said not transitory, housing activity was very, um, very damaged. And finally, in another measure of the housing market on the right is prices. Now, the columns are the month-over-month -month change in prices, and the blue line is the year-over-year -year change. You can see that housing prices at one point were rising at really an outrageous 21% year-over-year. -year. That's COVID driving those prices. But over the past seven months, those red columns, prices have been dropping, and the year-over-year -year rate is now down 3.8%. The point is, Federal Reserve raising rates like that has very much damaged the housing market and is deflating this uh, the, the prices, which is a good thing. But it's been all the other activity has been really hurt. The 
The other area where we see uh, the Fed affecting the economy is in manufacturing. Manufacturing's pretty rate sensitive. So the two measures over there on the left, durable goods orders, manufacturing, industrial production, you can see that they're both down towards zero or even negative. On the right is that Institute of Supply Management Index again for manufacturing. And remember, when things are under 50, that means it's contraction, contractionary. The brown line, the total index, they're 50, contraction. New orders at 47, contraction. So in this two charts, you see clearly decline in manufacturing activity, contraction. I think it's fair to say that manufacturing is actually in a recession already. And the labor market, the labor market. Remember, I told you at the beginning, the labor market headline is strong. But there are some details underneath that you know are revealing. The chart on the left is the year-over-year -year growth rate in uh, in job creation. Usually they say, oh, it's 100,000 jobs, but this is the rate at which jobs are being grown. You can see it's peaked and is now down in March 2.7 percent year-over-year. This is what happens as we uh, approach a recession: job growth slows down. Chart in the middle speaks to the labor shortage we've been talking about. Blue line is the number of job openings, and the brown columns are the number of job hirings. Well, openings, the blue line, have been down 19% annualized. Since February of last year, hirings, the brown's been down 9%. And that critical gap between the two, which really represents the imbalance, is down 33%. So to me, the hiring window is starting to close. And you can see also the chart on the right, initial jobless claims. This is where um, you know, somebody gets fired or gets laid off or the business goes out of business and person, ex-employee, has to go to their unemployment office and say, hey, I'm, I'm out of a job. I need my unemployment benefits. That's what the blue line is, the number of people every week that apply for that. You can see, you know, when the blue line is going down, jobless claims, well, the economy is good. There are fewer people claiming unemployment. But when it bottoms out here, that is, claims start to get bigger because the economy is weakening, it's followed by a recession, those gray columns. It happens here, 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 and it bottomed out in September of last year. Um, so I think it's you can see pretty clearly from this that there are problems in the labor market. Now, I think I have a, a case there, and I've got other things that could explain that, but I still get this pushback. I talk to people say, you know, what are you talking about uh, uh, a recession when it has such a strong labor market? My reply is, that's the way it works. You don't see job losses until the recession hits. Labor is the last thing to fall, basically because employers don't want to start cutting jobs unless they really have to. So when I say that's the way it happens, I'll show you this chart over on the left. Each chart is a different recession. Each line is a different recession. Starting 12 months before the recession, zero month, the vertical line is when the recession starts and then goes out another year. It's plotted, each of those lines is plotted against the number of jobs growing. So each recession, you don't have to figure them out. 12 months before the recession, jobs were growing. That positive job growth at six months, four months. Every recession, you're growing jobs right up, right up until the recession hits. And then that's when you start getting job losses. And this is the way it works. Every time labor is the last thing to go. Now, I've taken all those lines there on the right and averaged them in the chart on the right. That's um, the average over since 1972, showing the same thing, job growth, right up into the, uh, the recession, and then you get the losses. And given some assumptions, I reckon that the brown line is pretty much our current path. So you can see it's actually pretty well following along the historical pattern. Now, we've seen there and some leading indicators, went back just one leading indicator here, and there's some others, but favorite leading indicator of a lot of economists, one of mine is called the treasury yield curve. 
And give me a minute to explain this. This is the chart on the left. The treasury yield curve is just the difference between the 10 year treasury note and the three month treasury bill. It's the difference between short and long term interest rates. That's all. And as an example over here on the left in that yellow circle, we can see back at this time, the blue line, the difference was 200 basis points. That might be a case where you have the 10 year at 3% and the three month at 1%. And that gap is that 200 basis, point, that blue line. And if you step back, you can look at that blue line and see, huh, well, it's positive most of the time. And this is again, you know, over a 50 year chart. That makes complete sense because if you're going to lend money for 10 years, you're going to demand a higher interest rate than if you did for three months. Except once in a while, the Federal Reserve gets involved and starts to raise short term rates to the point that they get higher than long term rates and that blue line goes negative. Every time it does, it's followed by a recession. It goes in the late 60s here, uh, early 70s, late 70s, early 80s. 90s, 2000s, here's the Great Recession, and here's where we are now. Look at that blue line. That's at a record low, a record low. Very strong indicator. The other thing to take away from this chart is the length of those red lines. That's the lead, that's the uh, warning that the yield curve gives you. In other words, the yield curve goes negative, and then it's three to five quarters before you reach, reach a recession. So it gives you a warning, it's a leading indicator. What's important about this, which I think is really important, is that it's run by the bond market, basically an open market. And it basically is the bond market saying, hey, Fed, you've already gone too far. You've already gone too far. But it's not just the yield curve or other, other things, there's consumers, this chart on the right shows consumer confidence surveys, phone survey where they ask people, you know, are jobs plentiful now? And uh, people say, yeah, or are jobs hard to get? Well, not so much. But when that difference, that blue line is going up, economy is good, saying jobs are plentiful, they're not so hard to get. But when it peaks, it means that people are saying, uh, maybe not so plentiful as there were, uh, maybe getting harder. And it's, as soon as that peaks, every time followed again by a recession. So there are certainly cracks in the labor market that are really uh, pointing towards recession. Finally, we'll look at the last place that uh, the Fed has uh, really interfered or made mistakes is the banking crisis. There's the chronology there over on the left. We all know what happened there. Silvergate, Silicon Valley Bank, all the way. The big problem was the bank, Silicon Valley Bank, didn't do what banks are supposed to do, didn't do what their function is, which is to have assets that will cover deposits if they get withdrawn. Now, if people take out withdrawn, you got to have assets to cover them. Well, they bought long-term bonds thinking, oh, well, we've seen interest rates zero forever. Interest rates don't go up. Well, they did and the value of those bonds sank. So they basically didn't have enough money to cover the uh, uh, withdrawals. Duration mismatch, they call it. And, you know, uh, my response is you didn't see that coming, really, um, what banks are supposed to do. Um, there's some humorous thing over here about the Fed and how they gave 0% rates for too long. And then the Fed says, I'm sorry I raised those rates and crashed the price of those bonds. In fact, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna give you more free money, which is the problem in the first place uh, with these emergency loans. And then I'm gonna take away your free money by raising rates again, which will of course make your bond portfolio drop even more. So making two mistakes again that you made before, um, you know, it's loosening and tightening at the same time. So it created these emergency programs. Silicon Valley Bank failure led to new programs and led to borrowing at the Fed's discount window. Nobody borrows at the discount window unless there's big trouble. You can see borrowing at the discount window zero until we got the global financial crisis and back to zero. Nobody goes to the discount window. Then COVID back to zero. And then look, the regional banks soared. That's a, that's a real indicator of nervousness among the banks. 
If you add up the three programs of the discount window uh, and two other lending facilities uh, by the Fed, you get the four columns over here on the right. You know, the last column was uh, last uh, last week. Emergency borrowing, $312 billion. That's a big number. The point is that number was zero a few weeks ago. Zero. Not $312 billion. So there's clearly still concerns in the banking sector. And finally, even before we got to the banking crisis, credit standards were increasing. That's the chart over there on the left. This is the net percentage of banks increasing standards, uh, tightening credit, the brown lines for commercial real estate, the blue lines, commercial and industrial loans. It's going up, it's tightening credit, auto loans, credit cards. And here's a consumer survey saying, yeah, it's already affecting us. We're already seeing it more difficult to get credit. So let me just wrap up here quickly. We see some signs of strength in the economy, but there's really ominous signs of in the future. You know, purchasing power is being eroded by inflation. Uh, the housing market's been decimated. Manufacturing's in recession. We got a weakening labor market and a banking crisis. And this was all caused by being so late to trying to cure inflation. Uh, so the Fed started way behind, and the process, it's going to likely strangle the economy as well as inflation. So we see the recession starting probably in the second half of this year. That's, uh, that's our viewpoint, and at this point, I'll uh, hand it back over to Rain. Dan, thank you. One thing for sure, whether it's good news or bad news, we can always depend on you to give it to us straight in a very comprehensive and clear manner. So thank you again for your insight. And I'd like to thank all of my experts for their insight today. And I'd like to thank you as the participating audience for joining in and listening. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to submit those in the comment section. And I'd like to remind everybody that you can download the full Allianz Risk Barometer Report on this platform or by going to agcs.allianz.com. And to all of you out there, have a good day.